Before I have you turn somewhere, I want to read a passage. Just one verse and see if you know who this verse is referring to. And you could say there, you could call him a world record holder. What's it take to get a world record? It means everyone before you, you were faster than them, and everyone after you, you were faster than them. And this world record holder, as you could maybe call him, has impacted some of you so much that some of you have named one of your children after this man in the Word of God. But listen to this verse. Before him, there was no king like him. So before, no one was like Him. Who turned, so this is a specific aspect, this is the event you could say, there was no king like Him who turned to the Lord with all His heart, His soul, and with all His might, according to the law, all the law of Moses, nor did any like Him arise after Him. So you look before this king, no one was like Him. You look after, No one was like him. He stood out in turning to the Lord, in zeal for God, in repentance from darkness to light. He stood out above the rest. So who who does who is that speaking of? Yeah, Josiah. How many how many kids are named Josiah? I could think of at least two: the Wilkinsons, the Barrientes. Who else has a Josiah here that I couldn't think about? Ah, the McKinnons. Okay, Josiah. Josiah, go ahead and turn in your Bible to uh, let's let's turn to Second Kings. And there's a lot we could read. And for the sake of time, I, I cannot read all that is here, and I'm going to try to attempt to give you a big enough picture of this man of God, of Josiah. And it also says in Second Kings, turn to Second Kings twenty three. 2 Kings 23 is one of the places it writes of him. And it even says here in 22, 2, he did, turn, he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. All right, this is the type of man he was. He turned to the Lord, and then he didn't turn aside. All right? He did one turning, and he didn't turn back. He kept on. And it says there was no one like him. That's this man did not have a decline. He turned away from disobedience. He obeyed the Lord and he didn't go back. This is a man who reformed the nation on every single front possible. He sought to effect change wherever he could. I mean, literally every single place he could find, he was at it. He was zealous to reform the nation. Yes, he was even more zealous than David. He had a heart like David, it says. But we read about David in 1 Kings that he didn't turn aside except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And the author doesn't say that about Josiah. It says he didn't turn to the left or to the right. He kept on. He didn't have a decline. Josiah was unique. Very unique. Very unique. That's why I use that statement, a world record holder, to try to make it maybe more memorable in your mind. When you think about Josiah, right? he was very distinct in his turning to the Lord. You're not going to find another example of a king in the Old Testament history who had the zeal that he had. And there's something we can learn from him and apply in our own lives. And his, his event was not the 100 meter dash. It was the marathon. Year after year after year after year of dealing with this and with that and with this and with that. He was more determined than any other king. You know, sometimes you think about Phineas in the Old Testament, right? He, he heard a command about killing someone who's wrongly yoking themselves with someone. And hundreds of thousands of people heard this command from Moses and one man got up before all the others. And it was Phineas. And the Bible says he was jealous with the Lord's jealousy. We find that type of jealousy in this man, Josiah. He was very, very jealous for the Lord. 2 Kings 23.25 before him, there was no one like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart. All right? This wasn't just some external reformation that Josiah brought about. It was something that happened internally in the heart, at least in his own life. In this reformation, it had some guidance here. It says here it was according to all the law of Moses. 
Right? Josiah had a standard by which he was reforming everything too. It wasn't just his own thoughts. It wasn't just his own opinions. Right? If you're going to have revival, you've got to have a standard. And the standard is not the thoughts and opinions and the feelings of men. It's the Word of God that does not pass away. There are rules for the event, you could say. So, I want to consider Josiah. I want to think about him, and I hope that it will motivate you to live out the Word of God as you see this man gripped with a desperate hunger. This man hungered for righteousness. Right? Isn't what Jesus says in Matthew 5? Hunger for righteousness. This man, he hungered for righteousness. And so first, I want to look at a, a brief snapshot in 2 Kings 23, 4-5. This is just a brief snapshot of him In the middle of the race, you could say. This is not at the beginning. I want to look at the middle. Then we're going to go look at the beginning of the race. We're going to see something that happens that is very key to why he lives the way he lives. So 2 Kings 23.4 And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priest of the second order, and the keepers of the threshold, to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels made for Baal for Asherah, and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them outside of Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron. He carried their ashes to Bethel. And he just deposed the priest who the kings of Judah had ordained to make offerings in the high places at the cities of Judah and around Jerusalem. Those also who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and the moon and the constellations and all the hosts of heavens. And he brought out dealing with another thing. The Asherah from the house of the Lord outside Jerusalem to the brook Kidron. And he burned it and broke it at the Kidron and he beat it to the dust. You hear those words? Burned, broke, beat it to dust. And then he cast the dust of it upon the graves of the common people. And he broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes who were in the house of the Lord. He's dealing with the homosexuality even in the land where the women wove hanings for the Asherah. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had made offerings from Geba to Beersheba. And he broke down the high places of the gates that were at the entrance to the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city. And he goes on and on. This is in the middle of the race. You find a man who he sees something that is contrary to God's law and to God's will, and he's dealing with it. I mean, he's breaking this. He's crushing that. He's getting it out of the city. He's not just doing it right there and defiling that which is good. He's defiling all that which is evil. I mean, you could just picture a man with two swords just going around hacking like Samuel hacked Agag to pieces. Here, Josiah, he's hacking everything that dishonors God. He's being radical. Very, very radical. Here. Do you, do you see that zeal? Right? And there's a New Testament reality, right? If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better you, you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. There's a New Testament reality the violent take the kingdom of heaven by force. When we hear about David pursuing his enemies and crushing them until they were unable to rise, what are we to pursue and crush until it's unable to rise? Sin? What else? False doctrine, sin, false doctrine, lies. We are hunting that down. What does Paul say in Ephesians 6? What do we wrestle against? Flesh and blood? No, he says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers and things that are not of this earth. Right? We're in a spiritual realm. As you read this, you, you know the obvious application is not us all getting swords from the pawn shop and going to war. Right? It's sharpening this sword we already got and going to war against our sin. And so here he is. He's in the middle. He's in the middle of the race. In the middle of the race. Something had just happened prior to this. Something had happened. A very key event that we've not yet talked about. And you could think of it like this. You could think of a man. He's running the race. And then he looks in the stands. And he sees something so gripping in the stands. And in in our scenario, it might be the, the, the child's father. Right? And he's so gripped with love for his father that he all the more runs the faster. Josiah had something like that happen. He saw something. And after that happened, all of what we just read, that's when it happened. It happened after Josiah 
saw something. What did he see? Go right, go right before in this chapter. And you'll see what he saw. Chapter 22. And Hokiah the priest said to Shapnan, the secretary, this is after they have already cleansed the temple. Josiah is in the middle of repairing the temple. He's cleansed all the evil from it. He sent men with money to repair the temple. And look what happens. Hilkiah the high priest said to Shopnon the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shopon, and he read it. And Shopon the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shopnon the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shopon read it before the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Look back at verse 8. The randomly going to repair a temple that he has already cleansed out. And they find a book there. It says, it says they found it. That word found, it, it, it implies they didn't know where it was. They knew of it. They knew of the law. But at some point, as the leadership is failing in Judah, guess what happened? They didn't have the book. They didn't have the written revelation and the truth that had been given through Moses. They didn't have it. And Josiah is already involved in reforming things. You could already say a revival has started. But the big turning point is when he found the book. He found the book. He was confronted with the Word and the truth of the Lord. And look at his response here. Verse 11, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, what did he do? He tore his clothes. He tore his clothes. Now, just get some of the context. Flip over to 2 Chronicles 34. And if you have a bookmarker, keep it in 2 Kings. We're going to go back there. But go to 2 Chronicles 34. It gives us a better perspective of the timeline of, of Josiah. You know, Josiah came from a very, very dark background. It says that Manasseh, his, his grandfather, he led the nation away to do more evil than the other nations. More evil than the Amorites did. It says in 2 Kings that the Lord said to them, I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish. Wiping it and turning it upside down. Isn't it interesting? The Bible actually talks about washing your dishes. And it uses it as an illustration where you're the dirt. And God is the one who's wiping this dish and cleansing it of the filth of the people who were corrupting and breaking the covenant. But 2 Chronicles 34. Now we're going to the start. Right? We've looked at the middle of the race. We've even seen what really affected him to run all the, more, all the faster. But look at 2 Chronicles 34. This is the start. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Eight. He was eight. His father had been assassinated. So he came to the throne rather quickly at a young age. He began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father. And he didn't turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Verse 3. For in the eighth year, so he's 16, the eighth year of his reign, he's 16 years old. And what happens? In the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David, his father. He began to seek God. He started seeking God. And then it goes on here. The twelfth year, he began to purge Judah into Jerusalem of the high places. And he goes on in verse 4, he chopped stuff down, he cut down things, he broke to pieces, he made to dust. All that happening, it says here, in the twelfth year. Then you go over. Verse 8, 
Now in the 18th year of His reign, when He had cleansed the land and the house. Alright, and that's what we just read about in 2 Kings. That was the 18th year. All that we read about was happening in the 18th year. He had cleansed the land, cleansed the temple. They found the book. That's kind of the timeline here. So you see this progressive running the race faster and faster until he's confronted with the very Word of God. So here's a man who had a dark upbringing. His father was assassinated. He became king at eight years of age. He was born in an era that was just flat out dark as dark could be. Israel and Judah was said to be more wicked than the Ammonites who God had killed. And that, that's pretty bad. Right? The people living are more wicked than the ones God had killed. He was young. He could have easily been influenced. Right? No doubt like his father and others had. His father was a wicked man. But he didn't decline. The text says he never went to the left or the right. He didn't decline. This is not a short-term, lived-out zeal. And here they go and, and do something simple like repair the temple. And if you read on in Second Chronicles, it represents that account right here in verse 19. Same words as in Second Kings. When the king heard of the words of the law, he tore his clothes. And then what did he do? He found the book. Did he put it on the shelf? Says we'll read that later? No. Right away, he wanted to get some commentary, you could say. And what is he? He commands them, verse 21, go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. And then look what hit him from the book. For great wrath of the Lord is poured out on us. Right? Because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do all according to this written in this book. Josiah has already been dealing with idols, dealing with all manner of stuff, but now he's confronted with the book. And he all of a sudden realizes the perspective he thought he had on righteousness was not exactly right. And God's wrath not being there, that was not exactly right. That wrath is still over this nation and their abominations. And he recognized he had not dealt as thoroughly with everything as he should have. He came face to face with that reality. Great wrath. We didn't do all according to the Word. We have not kept the Word of the Lord. And so what do they do? They go to get some commentary, some interpretation. Verse 22, they go to Holda the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tokanath. And she says to them, verse 23, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to Me, thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants all the curses that are written in the book that was read before the king of Judah. So whatever he read, it contained a bunch of curses that are written. At least that was part of what he read. Why? Verse 25, "...because they have forsaken Me and have made offerings to other gods, that they might provoke Me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore My wrath will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah who sent to inquire of the Lord, thus you shall say to him, thus is the Lord the God of Israel, regarding the words you have heard, because your heart was tender." This is how Josiah received and heard the Word. Your heart was tender. You humbled yourself before God when you heard His words against this place and its inhabitants and you have humbled yourself before Me and have torn your clothes and wept before Me. I also have heard you, declares the Lord. And the Lord goes on to say He will gather Josiah to His grave in peace, but the nation, they still have wrath over them. And you know what Josiah does? Does Josiah just say, well, I've got peace and I've got a promise that it's all going to be well with me. I guess I can just go sit down over there and just let everything play out as it said it's going to happen? He didn't do that. He didn't do that at all. Verse 29, what do you do when you find treasure? You go and share it with others. The king sent. He gathered together all the elders. goes on verse 30, he gathered together all the people, small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. He read the whole thing. 
Now, what was he reading? That, that's something you could debate over, but at least it was the book of Deuteronomy. If you go read the whole book of Deuteronomy, it'll take you about two and a half hours. Maybe it was referring to the entire Pentateuch. The first five books of the Old Testament. Many believe that's what they found. Right? It was, in a way, left in a box because they weren't using it. Right? It wasn't their standard. The wicked kings prior to him. I mean, Hezekiah clearly used the law. But you have a downgrade happening. I mean, what if it was the first five books and he just read the entire thing before the whole people? Do you know how long that meant the meeting was? 15 hours. So we're going to read the first five books of the Bible and then we'll get no. But you know what? When you're truly at a crisis point, time does not matter to you. Right? You're willing to sit and you're willing to read all night. I mean, I remember talking to someone who was under conviction of their sin, and I met with them the following day. They had not slept. They had read through the Bible as much as they could the entire night. Not because I told them to do it, but because they had a fear of God. Like Josiah, they had a sense of there's wrath above us. It's like finding out you've got cancer. You want to figure out what's the cure. You don't push it off later on. You're trying to figure out now, how can we stop this? So Josiah... Is leading the nation to do, even though he's got his ticket punched, you could say. He's not content with that. Why? Because he's a godly leader. Right? He wants, he wants the people. But here, buried in a box in the garage, was the book of books. This wicked nation had so neglected God, and here they find his commands and his word were out of mind. We're out of sight. We're out of mind. Here the highest divine revelation they had, it was found. That which was unnoticed and unknown in most of their apostasy was now right before their faces. And He gathers everyone together and they spend all the time it takes to read every last word. Right? They don't got to go to work because wrath is coming. They don't need to go to bed because wrath is coming. It's of utmost importance. Utmost importance. It says that He read all the laws of Moses or the words of the Lord by Moses or the covenant. So many would argue it's the first five books. He didn't put the book on the shelf. He didn't do something later. He read it right then, right there. So here you have Josiah. He sought God from 16 years old and now at 24, by the providence of God, he finds the book. And it changes everything all the more. Again, the, all that happened in 2 Kings happened after the book. He did stuff before, and he's doing that reform after. It drastically changed his race because he was now confronted with the truth. It's as if he's running and he looks up there and he sees something through the Word of God and he realizes the situation is far more desperate than I perceived it initially was. The situation for my children is far more desperate than I initially perceived it was I've got to go harder after the Lord. Jeremiah, who was alive in his day, wrote in Jeremiah 23, he said, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? It's like Jeremiah is hearing, or, or Josiah is hearing this red, and it's like God is having this big hammer, and he's just breaking everything around him and crushing reality and letting him see this is reality. What you had was a false perspective. And he tore his clothes. Go inquire of the Lord. Get an interpretation from Holda. And he hears from Holda, and she says, Yeah, things are as bad as they appear. Wrath is coming. The curses are there. And it's amazing, isn't it? Here you think everything is pretty well, everything's okay. And then you just flip over here and you read something else, and all of a sudden you recognize wait a minute, I don't have a full picture. I don't have a full perspective on reality. And he probably read, if it's from Deuteronomy, you don't need to turn there, but it's incredible in Deuteronomy 28, which was most likely read. It says in verse 15, if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all His commandments and statutes, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. 
Cursed shall be you who live in the city. Cursed will you be in the field. Cursed shall your basket and your kneading bowl be. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. The, sin will, the Lord will send on you curses, confusion, frustration, and all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on the account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. I mean, imagine, that's just a couple verses. You read that whole chapter, it's terrifying. I mean, Josiah hears this. Shakes him, he tears his clothes. He calls everyone there. We gotta, guys, we've got to read this whole thing. Do you see what's going on? See, natural man doesn't want to know what's going on. They don't want to go to the Word of God. They don't want to go to Romans 3. They don't want to go to Ephesians 2. They want to stick their head in the sand and not face reality. Josiah, he's the opposite of that. A good leader wants everything out in the light. Everything out right there in the open. I mean, imagine reading just the whole book of Deuteronomy, how that would affect you. It says in verse 58, if you're not careful to do all the words of this law, if you don't fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring on you and your offspring extraordinary afflictions, severe and lasting sickness and grievous sicknesses and lasting sicknesses. You know what also says in Deuteronomy? That Josiah probably read before the people? Deuteronomy 13.9 If your brother, the son of your mother, or your son or your daughter or your wife that you embrace, or your friend who is your own soul entices you secretly, saying, let us go and serve other gods. What did the law say under Old Covenant Israel that they should do? Kill them. Right? As Charles Leiter said, what we do when our family members go and worship false gods is we bring them up at prayer meeting and say, let's pray for them. Right? Here, Old Covenant law, you have a physical nation with actual laws and rules just like our American government, and their law said you're to go kill that person, even if it's your own family member who's leading you astray. Your hand shall be the first against him to put him to death. Isn't that amazing? And you know what? Josiah had such a fear of God that he went and he sought to live every last thing out here in Deuteronomy all the way to taking the Passover and seeking to follow the Passover exactly as it was said. He had a standard and he was consumed with obeying that standard to every little detail. He was gripped with the Word. He reformed on every front. And then, if you're in Second Chronicles, you find the Passover happens in 35. Josiah kept a Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem. And just look at these statements. Verse 4, He did as prescribed in the writing of David, the king of Israel, and the document of his son Solomon. The end of verse 6, He did according to the word of the Lord by Moses. And then Josiah, verse 7, He contributes to the lay people over 30,000 of his flock for the sacrifice for the Passover. This is a very good ruler. Verse 12 at the end, He did everything as written in the book. Verse 13, He did according to the rule. Verse 15, according to the command of David. In verse 18, it says, no Passover like it had been kept in Israel since the days of Samuel the prophet. You see, you you got a man, he's like, is there a rule? Is there a law? And he's seeking to obey the Word and the standard he had as an Old Covenant Israelite He's seeking to obey it and honor God in every single possible way that he can. He's zealous. And this text says there was none like him. I mean, this is the supreme example of a man who found the Word. He's studying the Word. He's getting it interpreted. He realizes the true sense of the situation. And he's seeking to deal with every little thing he possibly can. I mean, you get the idea. He's not even sleeping. This is such a desperate situation. Josiah is not a procrastinator. He's not what says in James 1, be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Like a man who looks in his natural face in the mirror, he's looking in the Word of God, he sees what's there, and then he goes away and at once he forgets what he saw. What does Josiah do? He goes away and at once he deals with what he saw. He doesn't forget. He deals with what 
He saw. He even dealt down to the internal things in people's houses. It says in 2 Kings, he went and put away the mediums and the necromancers and the household gods. Right? You know, we joke about the government coming and taking our guns, right? Josiah, they went and they went in your house and they took your household idols. They went and they did that. And he was commanded to do that. Right? Under this law of this nation, he was commanded to do that. My point is not that all those commands are something for us to follow, right? We're not under this old covenant. My point is the standard he saw and he had, he sought to live it with his whole heart, his whole mind, and all of his strength. And that's what the text says about him. He was all in. He was all in. So, how does this apply to you and I? First, if, if you are unaware, if you're new to Christianity, there's a massive distinction between the Old Testament nations waging war, as we've just read about, and what we are called to do as a Christian. And as I already mentioned, we're fighting in a spiritual realm. Our standard is not the law of Moses, but the law of Christ. He is the standard. He said on the, on the Mount of Transfiguration, you had the law, Moses gone, you had Elijah, the prophets gone, and who was left? The Son. And the Father says, this is My Son. Listen to Him. Christ has come. And He's given us standards by which we should live. He's called us to a standard in the Sermon on the Mount and many other things that He expects are going to be true of those who are in His kingdom. We don't get the physical sword. We go get the spiritual sword and we do, we do battle. But ask yourself this, how does the Word of God impress upon your heart when you read it? Right, we all have dry seasons as was mentioned earlier, but what, how, how serious do I take some of the things that I read from the Scriptures? How serious? Do, do, does it make me want to rip my shirt and have some sense of grief of the state of things? Josiah looked at himself. He saw what was wrong and he dealt with it. Isaiah 66 says, this is the one to whom the Lord will look. He who is humble, Contrite in spirit, and does what? Trembles at my word. Josiah trembled at the word of God. The evidence he trembled at it was he didn't just go and have conviction and rip his shirt and do a public, do a public show of grief and then go home and do the opposite. He went and he did exactly as he had read. Exactly as he had read. You think about the New Testament example of Felix. What happened to Felix? He's hearing the word, and how did Felix respond? He trembled. He says he trembled at what Paul said. But what did he say to Paul? Come back when? At a more convenient time. Was that Josiah's mindset? No, Josiah's mindset was now is the convenient time. Right? I'm going to deal with this now if my conscience is not clear, if there's an idol in my heart. This should make us ask this question. Have I read the entire Bible? And am I continuing to read the entire Bible? When I was first converted and came to this church, I'll never forget a Tuesday night Bible study at an apartment building. Tim was leading it, and he said, everyone who's read the whole Bible, raise your hand. I was shocked that he'd even asked that. Right? Kind of a, you know, you keep that secret, right? Uh, (laughs) I was surprised he asked it because in my pride at that point, I had not read the whole Bible. And you know, everyone who raised their hand, it was all the women. All the young men who were zealous evangelizing obviously didn't have enough time to actually read the Bible to know exactly what to say. And I determined at that point, he said, this is a love letter if you really love the Word of God. How could you go home and leave a chapter unread? I took it to heart. I'm going to go read. I want to know everything. I remember sitting at a Starbucks downtown on the roof where it wasn't all this loud noise and I was reading Jeremiah the whole book in one day, front to back. I couldn't believe what I saw. I mean, I, so much of it was even quoted in sermons without people mentioning the reference. And I thought, oh, that's why Paul Washer says that. It's from the Bible. <laughs> I wanted to know what was in this book. Not just speed reading, but meditating, chewing on it. So have you read the entire Bible? Are you continuing to read the whole Bible? There's some people, they read the whole Bible every three months. Most read it every once a year. Some will change versions every year to have a different look. They'll go NASB, NKJV, ESV, just to get a fresher sense. Maybe see some things in the passage that they haven't seen. 
Josiah wanted to share the Word of God with everyone. He called a meeting, and for 15 hours maybe, they read. It's remarkable. Now, many of us, where are we at in the race? We're right now currently living out the Word of God. And I want to give you an encouragement. Go back to 2 Kings 23. I want you to see this. This is an encouragement for you and I. We're right now in the race. Okay? And maybe some of you are trying to go faster with whatever God has called you to do. And in the midst of Josiah, being in this race, God marvelously encourages him. 2 Kings 23.15 And this is, this is incredible. So at this point, he's already, he's already going even to further regions than the initial place where he was purging everything. And it says, Moreover, the altar at Bethel, the high place erected by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, that altar with the high place, he pulled down, He burned and reduced it to dust. He also burned the Asherah. And look at verse 16. Here you are in the middle of living out the Word of God in your life. Josiah turned and he saw the tombs there on the mount. What's the big deal? And he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it according to the Word of the Lord that the man of God proclaimed who had predicted these things. Wait a minute. So what is happening right now that Josiah is doing has been predicted. Look at verse 17. Then he said, what is that monument that I see? And the men of the city told him, it's the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and predicted these things that you have done, and I would add, just done against the altar at Bethel. And he said, let him be, let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came out of Samaria. 300 years earlier, do you know the, the story of the old, the old prophet? Well, the young prophet came. The one who the old prophet deceived and it led to him dying. That young prophet, he came with a word 300 years earlier. It's recorded in 1 Kings 13. It says this, And the man cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord. 300 years earlier, this is when it's happening. O altar, O altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David. And he doesn't just say a son shall be born. He names him. Josiah by name. And he shall sacrifice on you, speaking to the altar, the priest of the high places who are making offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. And lo and behold, that exact thing happens 300 years later. And right after Josiah had just finished fulfilling that and doing that, an old guy from the city says, yeah, all this you just did was predicted. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, why didn't he hear about it? There's no evidence he ever heard about this previously. Just right there, he heard about it after fulfilling that. I'm telling you, if you're Josiah and you just fulfilled one aspect of God's Word, this prophecy made 300 years later, and you just hear about that, and he's already going to outer regions and dealing with idolatry further out than the hub where it was, what's that going to do if you're Josiah? Do you want to go back home now? No, it makes you want to go all the harder. Because you realize what you're doing is fulfilling a very Word of God. You're fulfilling prophecy by your conduct. Okay, so here you and I are. In the middle of obeying the Lord. Maybe some of you you doubt. People are saying, my family says I'm too zealous. Why do I want to go to church meetings multiple times a week? Why do I, why, you know, they, when I tried to shred all these video game DVDs that I played too much, my, my mom said I'm crazy. You're thinking you're too zealous. People are saying things to you. In the middle of obeying the Lord, he has a prophecy that encourages him to keep going on all the harder. And you would be amazed how often this happens in you and our lives and we don't realize it. Let me just let me give an example here. Imagine mothers. Here you're in the middle 
And you might not say you're in the middle of fulfilling a prophecy. You might not say you're in the middle of doing the will of God. You would phrase it like this. I'm in the middle of the daily grind of raising my children. You know what? You could actually restate that. You're in the middle of fulfilling prophecy. You're in the middle of fulfilling the very Word of God of what was said you would do. 1 Timothy 5, what does it say? If she's brought up children... I mean, Paul just assumes that's what women are doing. They're bringing up children. If they have children, they're bringing them up. And the mother sits there and says, well, this is mundane. No, it's actually the very Word of God. You're living that out. You should be encouraged in the middle of doing that. Not to grow weary. He says if she's brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the feet of the saints, cleaned the carpet all of the time, cared for the afflicted, devoted herself to every good work. Paul says that in the Word of God. So here you are, you're laboring away, you feel discouraged, and you open the First Timothy 5, and all of a sudden you look and you say, oh, I'm in the middle of doing the very things the Word of God has said. Exactly. Keep on. Don't quit. Be encouraged. Yeah, it doesn't have your name in it. Would that encourage you more if it, if it said on there, instead of if she, it would say all of the sisters' names in the building? She is brought up. You see, Josiah's out there killing idolaters and burning and crushing temples, and you're at home changing diapers and teaching them how to read and blend words and all of that, Josiah is fulfilling the Word of God and you're fulfilling the Word of God. And Josiah is encouraged in the middle of fulfilling the Word by a prophecy he did not know happened 300 years ago. And I'm telling you, there's a lot from the Word of God said 2,000 years ago that should encourage you even in the mundane obedience of the Christian life. And you could say, well, you know, man, he was called. Wow, what if I had a word like that about me? Spoken 300 years earlier. Uh, you do. You do. Ephesians 1, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Uh, John 10, he calls his sheep by name. Uh, you do. You see, if you're here today and you're a Christian, it's not an accident. God chose you in Him before the foundation of the world, and He prepared good works that you should walk in. Ephesians 2.10. Right? Keep on. That's, that's, that has been declared and said by the Lord. He has made works for you to do, even that of raising children, and you want to be all out faithful for this living God. Right, God is predict. May, may hear another situation. You know, the guy says, "Well, the, it's been predicted." You know what? Also, the Bible says has been predicted that some of you wives will have lost husbands. First Peter three one. It says you can win them without even a word. Right? God has predicted that, and so be faithful in the test and obey His word because He has made it clear it is not abnormal, and these type of situations will happen in the Christian. Life. So when we go to the Word of God, we see the state of things. Right? Without the Word of God, we don't have a true perspective on reality. We've got to be renewing our mind from Scripture. What is God honoring? In you? Maybe ask this question. What in your life right now is not God honoring because of ignorance? What if there's something you just totally lack clarity of it? But what happens if you don't know the Word, you will not be as severe as you should have been. Remember in the timeline, Josiah was being very violent against the idolatry, but when he found the Word, his level of severity all the more increased. That's what happened. Same thing with you and I. We find something in the Word of God and it all the more heightens our sensitivity towards sin and the ways by which we maybe have grieved the Holy Spirit and we all the more get violent about that. What's a verse you know of that you're not obeying? Maybe it's in Ephesians 4. Maybe it's in James 5. I don't know. Is there some verse in the Word of God that you should obey? You're confronted with it. Get out in faith and be zealous like Josiah. God will honor that. You've been predicted to live out that very text. That's why it's there. So go and do it in faith. You know, One thing to think about here for us do warnings of wrath and judgment motivate you? That's what motivated Josiah. It wasn't a bunch about the love of God. It was about wrath and judgment. That motivated him to go tell all the people. In the same way, a true reality of hell should motivate us in our evangelism. We also find here leadership was at fault for the law book being buried in a box. 
I mean, wherever it was, wherever it got found, it's sad that even in today's generation, how many people, they, they're going to a church, they're not really being confronted with the truth, and one day, they're rumbling around on YouTube and they run into something and all of a sudden they're confronted with truth. And rather than thinking, hey, I'm good to go because I've said the sinner's prayer many years ago, they all of a sudden realize, wait a minute, am I even a true Christian? They're just digging there. And they hear, find Matthew 7. They didn't even know it existed in their Bibles. Think about the time before Martin Luther due to the Catholic papacy. The Bible was not accessible. It was not known. Scriptures were brought forth after that time to every man and to every language. Colossians 3, it says, we should let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I mean, are you grateful to have a Bible? I'll tell you, Josiah, for 300 years, they didn't have the scroll. They didn't know where it was at. I mean, imagine if none of us had a Bible, but we heard there was some scroll buried in San Antonio somewhere. I mean, we go find it. And isn't it interesting who allowed them to find it? Providence of God. And you know what it even tells us about God? God does what to His Word? Preserves it. I mean, how many other copies were around? I don't know. What if that was the last copy? God will preserve His Word. The grass grass will wither, the flowers will fade, but the Word of the Lord will remain the same. Well, a few more applications here. Thoughts in closing. It's, It's interesting when you read this passage in 2 Kings 23, 26. It's somewhat shocking when you get to 26. After all this reform has happened, it says still the Lord did not turn from the burning of His great wrath. Still. You would somewhat think that after all that had happened, the wrath would be removed. I remind you though, we have a God who keeps His Word. Right? And He had already said that wrath was going to come. And all the wickedness had already been stored up for generations that that wrath would come. After Josiah's death, one of his sons becomes king a very short amount of time. Then another becomes king. And shortly there later, Nebuchadnezzar comes in. And he takes them to exile to Babylon. God had that judgment and it needed to happen. Despite all that He had done, that still happened. But it does make me think about us, the Christians, right? Still, the Lord did not turn from the burning of His great wrath. You know, we got the good news that that's not true of us. And the reason He's not, His wrath is not towards us, it has been turned away, it's not because our works. We do works out of love for the one who died for us. But the reason the wrath is removed is because Christ bore it on the cross. Thirteen years after this Passover, Josiah dies at age 39. And it's again, this is another somewhat shocking reality. I'd be wrong to leave it out. 2 Chronicles 35, after the Passover, it says, verse 20, after he prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, went up to fight at Carchemish on the Euphrates. Josiah went out to meet with him. But he sent envoys to him saying, what have we to do with each other, king of Judah? This is, this is the Egyptian. I am not coming against you this day, but against the house with which I am at war. And God has commanded me to hurry. Cease opposing God. This is the guy from Egypt. Cease opposing God who is with me, lest He destroy you. So here the Lord gives a word through this lost Egyptian king to Josiah. Verse 22, Nevertheless, Josiah did not turn away from him, disguise himself in order to fight with him. He didn't listen to the words of Necho from the mouth of God. And Archer, verse 23, it shot, it hit Josiah, it led to his death. That's how he died. At 39, somewhat of an odd ending to this man's life. You, you, just wouldn't, you wouldn't expect that to be the reality. I don't know. What, what do you take from that? I mean, one thought I had was this. Here's a man who heard a prophetic word Right, even from Huldah, and what did he do? He took it dead serious. He took this dead serious. Ironically, though, a word from God through this Egyptian he ignores, and it leads to his death. And here's a man who was confronting so much error, 
And then he wrongly, unnecessarily confronts this Egyptian. Maybe that's something to learn from it. A man's positive characteristic of zeal and confronting everything, he went to regions and things by which he had no belonging to be there. And God tell, Nico's telling him through the Lord, you got no business to be here. And Josiah went anyways. Maybe his zeal took him too far. I don't know. That happens to us sometimes, right? In all our zeal, we may do some things that are not right. We may engage in certain conflicts that we shouldn't. Maybe that's a lesson for us. Well, some might say, well, I'm not a king like Josiah. How does this apply to me? I would ask you this. Are you a father? Are you the head of a household? I mean, you've got your kingdom right there in part. How are you influencing them? Are you reading the Word of God to them 15 hours a night? You know, are you putting... Bef- no, no, don't, don't... Even a 15-minute devotional might be a... If you go longer than that... Well, I won't get into that now, but th- you need discernment. Some parents hear the need to do devotionals and they think about an hour-long Bible study. Josiah cleansed the temple. I mean, I don't have a temple to cleanse. I mean, how does that apply to me? Wrong answer. You do have a temple to cleanse. Where is it at? Yeah, our body. 1 Corinthians, or do you not know? So obviously some people didn't know. Interesting, isn't it? They didn't know. And Paul gives that as a reason to not be sexually immoral. He's imparting knowledge to them in their ignorance because that should change how they live. You see, the Word of God is constantly being introduced to change the conduct of how one lives. Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? whom you have from God. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. What high places do you have left in your heart? What do you got there? Here another thought is, you're never too young to seek the Lord. You know, children, it's amazing. Kids think they're young. They think they have a lot of time. Think with me. Josiah, when did he start to seek God? The eighth year of his reign when he was 16. Right? How old was David's niece who just died a couple days ago? Nine. If Josiah would have waited till he was 16 to seek God and he died at nine, he'd be in hell. He would have perished. You don't know if you've got tomorrow. Today is the day to seek the Lord. Right? We've got to constantly be pressing our kids with the urgency of today is the day of salvation. You just don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, look, recently these emails coming out. Young children having the bacteria and in the hospital and different things happening. I mean, it makes you realize our kids are fragile. We've got to be faithful. Put the Word before them. It's also an encouragement if you're a child, you can, you can absolutely make a difference. You can seek God at a very young age. You can be zealous for the Lord. You don't need to wait until you're in your 20s for that. Here another thought is don't be mild in the battle against sin. It won't do you any good. Don't say to me, I don't have any wooden statues to destroy. Again, you've got things in the heart. I do that we have to keep killing. In Acts 19.19, a number of these people who were converted, they practiced magic art. They brought all their books together and they burned them in the sight of everyone. And it goes on to say it cost a lot of money. You see, it didn't matter how much money that cost. It was dishonoring to God, so they radically cut it off out of love for the Savior. Another thing we learn here is a nation cannot live on the victories of the past. Josiah died. Everything got dark. He died. The lights went out. You see how quickly a nation can descend into complete biblical ignorance so quickly. And that's where we're headed as Americans right now. D.A. Carson said the church is never more than a generation or two from apostasy and oblivion. We need to hold on to the Word. We need to hide the Word in our heart. And lastly here, how does this all point to Christ? How does this point to Christ? Think about this. The Old Testament it says these things are written. They speak of the Lord Jesus. Just as the book of law was found, in some, you could say, an obscure place, it was accidentally found in God's providence, so in God's providence, a baby was found. Christ. Right? God sent His Son. Just as Josiah was prophesied by name 300 years earlier, so Christ was prophesied about thousands of years earlier. 
Even as Zechariah wrote, on that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David. And there is a fountain filled with blood. Christ on that cross. Just as Josiah destroyed the works of the devil and reformed, so Jesus destroys the works of the devil and reforms. He lived the perfect life. He put a standard He has called us to. He's done away with the Old Covenant. Praise be to God that when my family members go after idols, I don't need to go grab a sword. I need to go get on my knees and pray for them. I'm glad about living right now in this New Covenant. I I like it. (laughs) And you know what? What happened to the majority of that nation? They perished. It wasn't a heart change. It was for Josiah. His heart was changed. It says that. The text says that about him. But most of them, they went right back. Same thing, you think about Nineveh. They all repented, but what happened to Nineveh got wiped out not that much later. Often through the Old Testament, you find men who are turning from judgment, but they ultimately don't turn from their own heart and soul to live the Lord. It says here, Josiah made them serve the Lord. He was forcing a nation, which is what he's supposed to do to serve God. But true Christianity, you serve from the heart. The Lord's changed the heart. Josiah was consumed with zeal. Christ was too. He said, zeal for my house will consume me. Josiah held a Passover. What did it say? It said his Passover was like none other. None other since the days of Samuel. Well, I got news for you. Christ held a Passover too. And it was like none other. I mean, literally like none other. Josiah, at his Passover, he brought 30,000 of his sheep. He brought 3,000 of his oxen. That's pretty generous of him. What did Christ bring to the Passover? Himself. He brought Himself. He contributed one lamb. Not 30,000. And that one lamb was perfect. And that one lamb was Himself. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And He's left us with one book. It's not that big. We should be diligent to read it, rightly interpret it. Many butcher the Old Testament. Even what Craig's dealing with in Galatians is trying to encounter heirs. The Hebrews Roots movement is plaguing people right now in other churches. We, we need to rightly interpret the Word of God and then obey it. Obey it. And think about Josiah. He reformed a whole nation, but it was for a short time. But Christ reforms an entire nation of regenerate believers for a lifetime, not for some brief moment. And Josiah turned away wrath for a short time, but Christ has come and He turns away the wrath for all time. He's fully appeased that wrath. He is the propitiation, the wrath-removing sacrifice that has removed all the wrath of God that I deserve in hell for all of an eternity. It's gone. Let's pray. Father, Lord, help us to keep looking to Your Word as we run the race. Lord, here Josiah by faith conquered kingdoms. Lord, we want to conquer too. Lord, You've called us to be Your soldiers. Lord, we want to be stirred up like Josiah was from the Word of God. We want to keep living out the things that You've predicted would happen. Lord, even if we can't see it clearly, Lord, how many things You've said were going to happen. You've said there's works prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Lord, that's, we want to walk in them. Sometimes we're scratching our head, which, what is it? Lord, guide us. Guide my brethren. Lord, help us to have many Josiahs among us, Lord, who are constantly wanting to be reformed according to what You've said in Your Word. Constantly wanting to inquire of You and correctly understand the very Word of God and to live it out. And Lord, would You keep us Lord, from letting our zeal take us too far? Lord, if that's, if that's the lesson from Josiah's death, Lord, I don't know. But if that is what it is, Lord, help us to have zeal according to knowledge. Lord, we don't want to be like the Pharisees. We don't want to be like the hyper-charismatics and have all manner of zeal that is not according to biblical knowledge. Lord, we want to be according to Your Word. We want to hide the Word in our heart. We want the Word to dwell richly in us. And Lord, I think of the little kids that, that are named after Josiah. Lord, would You save those three little boys in our church? Lord, they bear a name. Lord, may they live out in true of that very name. Lord, and not go to the left or the right and have their whole heart solely for You. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.